Hello, and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Inez Mohammed for a lecture entitled Psychological Safety as an ACGME Requirement, Challenges and Solutions. Dr. Mohammed completed her residency at the University of Toledo and was an abdominal imaging fellow at the University Hospitals of Cleveland. She is an assistant professor of radiology, division of abdominal imaging at Case Western Reserve University, University Hospitals of Cleveland. She's also the associate program director of the radiology residency. At the end of the lecture, please join Dr. Muhammad in a live Q&A session where she will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Muhammad, please take it from here. Hi, everyone. Um, um, my name is Ines Muhammad. I am an uh, assistant professor uh, of radiology, abdominal imaging, and the uh, Associate Program Director of the Residency. Today, we're going to talk about psychological safety as a new ACGME requirement. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, our objective today is to know what is psychological safety, what are the barriers, discuss the impact of um, creating a safety culture in healthcare, and also to uh, identify methods of fostering uh, psychological safety in the uh, residency program. Uh, so what is psychological safety? Psychological safety is a personal belief that one can speak up, take interpersonal risks, express concerns, admit mistakes without the fear of being shamed, blamed, or ignored. The aim is to create a culture where everyone feels comfortable admitting their mistakes so that we can learn from our mistakes. We turn our failure into learning opportunities. So next time when we are faced with the same challenge, we are able to take better decisions. Uh, as of uh, July 1, 2023, uh, ACGME has promoted psychological safety to be a requirement all residency programs have to comply. Per the ACGME uh, common program requirement definition, psychological safety is an environment of trust and respect that allows individuals to feel able to ask for help, admit mistakes, raise concerns, suggest ideas, and challenge ways of working and the ideas of others on the team, including those in authority, without fear of humiliation and the knowledge that mistakes will be handed justly and fairly. Now that we know what psychological safety is, we have to stress what psychological safety is not. It's not eliminating personal accountability. It is not a permission to incompetence. It is not a guaranteed applause. If I am saying that I'm gonna actively listen to you, that doesn't mean that I have to certainly agree. So psychological safety and accountability should go hand in hand in our residency programs. We don't want high psychological safety without accountability that will place our students in comfort zone. Okay, that means complacency. complacency. They don't know have they don't have to do anything. Um, if of course we don't want high accountability and low psychological safety, that's an anxiety zone. What we want is place our residents, our medical students in the learning zone where there are high accountability and uh, high psychological safety. Um, it is particularly challenging to foster psychological sa safety in healthcare. Why? There is built-in hierarchy in medicine. We have medical students, junior residents, senior residents, junior attending, senior attending, uh, section uh, sh chiefs, and and all and so on. We also have different teams working together. We have nurses, we have admin, we have technicians, and among these, there is hierarchy. Hierarchy is not built in to be a bad thing. Actually, the more senior person is most 
more knowledgeable. And this is put in place as checks and balances to ensure patient safety, to have better patient outcome. The problem, of course, is that um, it makes speaking up or uh, building a, a safe culture more difficult. Uh, other thing, of course, is lack of awareness. Why do we have to implement psychological safety? Um, multi-generational workforce. M most of our residents are in the uh, new millennials. Last year, radiology actually uh, matched the first generation Z. Um, each generation have their own aspiration, their own way of communication, their own uh, ways that they want to learn uh, through. So um, uh, other thing, of course, is that um, in medicine in general, it's challenging and fast-paced environments. Sometimes we have to take a crucial decision within seconds to save patients' life. It's not really easier in radiology. Uh, a big factor, um, a pillar for psychological safety is having interpersonal relationship between the education and learner. Um, radiology now is a hybrid learning environment where people are working remotely. Also, sometimes residents are working with attendings face-to-face -face in the reading room in the morning, and then they go on call and they're dealing with attendings they have never seen before. Other thing is that we are all under stress from the, um, the increasing clinical volume coupled with radiologist shortage. So why does it matter? Why do, is it important to actually have psychological safety in uh, our programs? Chernobyl, April 26, 1986, the worst nuclear disaster in history. Hundreds were killed, thousands left with uh, uh, consequences of high radiation exposure, including cancer. The Committee for Safety in Nuclear Installation, in their report on this end incident, for the first time, they introduced the term safety culture. It was said that that day in the control room, there were workers who knew that something was wrong with the experiment that they were doing, but they were so afraid, they were so worried that they will be humiliated. They were so afraid that if they spoke up uh, to those in power, they might get fired. Uh, also, it was said that there were two explosions that day. The people who actually managed to escape the first explosion were so occupied with um, who is going to be blamed for this disaster that they did not tell the people who were living within the vicinity of uh, this nuclear implant of this disaster that they have to run for, for their lives. People did not evacuate in this city for 36 hours. Fast forward 2003, Amy Edmondson was a PhD student. She was going from one hospital ward to the other uh, in a pediatric hospital. She was studying the relationship between working in um, a healthy environment, high trust environment, and mistakes. That's when she found out something that did not make sense to her. She found out something that was controversial. She found out that nurses who work in effective teams, who have good relationship, who have good leaders, were actually doing more mistakes than nurses who are working in a field culture. And when she investigated that further, she found out that no, they did not do more mistakes. They actually reported more mistakes. And that's when she wrote her 2004 paper, Learning from Failure in Healthcare. Dr. Amy Edmondson is the first to introduce the term psychological safety. She is the godmother of psychological safety. If you Google psychological safety right now, you will see her pictures, her talk. You will also see lots of information about the importance of psychological safety in, in business, in economy, but in fact, psychological safety was implemented for um, medicine. Why? Study after study has proven that there is a direct correlation between patient outcome and healthcare team working in a safety culture. I want you to, to grab your attention to this particular paper, which I think was very alarming. This paper was published in Annals of Surgery in 2019. 
imagine a complex abdominal surgery going on. And there was, in the OR, there was a resident, the surgeon who I am quoting here was notorious for explosive triads and uh, flying objects. And there was this invisible medical student who was watching the surgery going from far away. And when he noticed that, the green towel that's supposed to cover the handle where they uh, move the light was missing. Uh, and he also saw the surgeon and the medical student repeatedly reaching out and touching uh, this um, uh, handle, uh, which means that the surgery was contaminated. But he chose willingly not to speak up. He was scared that he's going to be humiliated from that surgeon, that he maybe he's not going to get the residency, uh, the surgery residency that he wants. By doing so, by not speaking up, he puts the patient on patient under um, uh, um, a severe risk of infection and sepsis. Another important thing that we have to be aware of is that we work in an environment of shared knowledge. Not one person, person knows everything. Um, everyone in the team have bits and pieces of information. And sometimes the most important information is not with the chair, it's not with the vice chair, it's not with the section head, not even the attending. The most important piece of information that's going to affect the patient is going to be with our frontline workers, which is sometimes a medical student, the technician, the nurse, the resident. That's why if we want to protect the patient, we have to protect the well-being of those entitled to care for them. Um, of course, there is um, a big um, um, correlation between burnout, which is emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and low personal accomplishment um, among residents in, uh, in healthcare. Uh, this particular paper, which was published in Medical Science uh, Education in 2020, had this survey of 110 residents in University of California from various programs, some from pathology, some from pediatrics, some from uh, radiology, some from surgery. And they gave them this questionnaire about mistreatment, mistreatment anywhere from gender and racial discrimination to belittlement and humiliation. And they gave them the, the mass lash burnout inventory, which um, is a standardized survey for prevalence of burnout. What they found out was that 42% of the written, of the residents witnessed mistreatment of the co-residents. 25% reported personal mistreatment. Those who report, reported personal mistreatment were eight times more likely to have burnout and four times more likely to report anxiety and depression. They found no significant relationship between depression, burnout, and anxiety, and the the speciality, the resident, it doesn't matter if they were in surgery or in pathology. It didn't matter if they had student debt. It didn't matter the race and the gender. The most important finding, in my opinion, was that mistreatment is rarely reported to institutions due to fear of retaliation or believe that they will be ignored. So if a resident or a medical student approach you and tell you, something is wrong, most likely this is just the tip of the iceberg. There is more There is more going on, and that's why we have to actively dig for um, psychological safety breaches. Um, we have residents, we have medical students, because we want to teach them, right? So one of the very important implications of psychological safety is on the learning ability. Um, we have to understand the cohort of the people we are dealing with. For a medical student, for a resident to get where they are today, they have um, continuously proven their success. They might be perfectionists or overachievers. These cohorts 
are particularly susceptible for what we call imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? It's chronic feelings of self-doubt and fear of being discovered as an intellectual fraud. Imposter syndrome makes them more sensitive to criticism and more um, aspiring, striving on uh, being acknowledged and being validated. Um, in early early 1900s, two pathologists called Yerkes and Dotson had this exper experiment. They, they had mice and they gave this group of mice a small amount of electric shock. And what they found was that, that this small amount of electric shock actually increased their learning ability and improved their performance. And they were better able to actually perform the task that they wanted, wanted them to do. When they actually increased the intensity of the electric shock beyond a certain limit, the mice focused on the, focused on the pain and their learning ability markedly declined and they were not able to perform the task. That's when the Yerkes dotson curve came out, which is actually the, the relationship between the performance efficiency and an anxiety. An optimal level of stress, like let's say having an exam, taking an exam, can help you focus on the task, but too much anxiety can impair your ability to concentrate and your performance begins to do it. To you. We see that in our residency programs, when we're part of CC meetings, when we see a sudden dip in the performance of residents who were before that doing well. I personally call that the cycle of fear. They go on call, they make a mistake, they get shamed and blamed. Now they have this self-doubt. They go into an anxiety. Next time they're in call, on call, they lose focus, more mistakes, mistakes and so on and so forth. The most important question, what can we do better in our programs? This is in a nutshell, what we can do better at an institutional level, interpersonal level, and individual level. This is not, these are not islands. These are actually complementary, intercommunicated. In my opinion, institutional is the easiest to implement. Interpersonal is a little bit bit more difficult. The most difficult by far is the ones that are individual or uh, personal level. Um, you know, the supporting mental health, financial assistance, ch child care support, struggling residents, whether academically or professionally. I think each topic in these needs a one hour uh, by itself. So today I'm going to, within maybe the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes, I'm going to focus on the institutional and the interpersonal level. And I believe the most important is feedback. Um, first, I'm gonna start with how can we train our residents to better receive negative feedback? When someone approaches me with a negative feedback, when someone approaches me and tells me, you did, you're not doing this right, you have to fix it. The first thing that has to come to my mind is gratitude. The person who actually takes the time, who cares enough, who takes the interpersonal risk, like they are risking their relationship with me to tell me um, I am doing something wrong and how to fix it. This person is a good guy. This is a person who cares about me. Second, we must have a goth mindset. A fixed mindset is that I made a mistake, I'm a failure, I give up. The ghost mindset is I made a mistake, this is a learning opportunity. Next time I'm going to work on myself and I'm not going to repeat this mistake again. As Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. In Emotional intelligence, they would tell you, when you face a flare of emotions, wait and identify your emotion, name your emotion. Um, you can invest, navigate the, the feelings through this emotional wheel. Are you actually mad or embarrassed? 
Are you threatened or um, uh, uh, guilty? Are you overwhelmed or uh, frustrated? So name your feeling. What are you feeling right now? And then forgive yourself. Uh, if somebody told you, I've never made a mistake in my life, they're not saying the truth. Everybody makes mistake. We fail fast to succeed sooner. And then once we have, take all our time to actually absorb our feelings, know what's, what's going on, and we must come make a plan. Make a plan before it's too late. If you somebody told you on your first call that this was, this was um, not the right thing to do, make a plan to fix it. Then second thing is how can we deliver a negative feedback? Um, we can use the six W's of investigation or, or we can say six W's of um, uh, negative feedback. Before you give someone a negative feedback, ask yourself these six questions. Why am I giving this person the negative feedback? To make them feel bad about themselves or to actually teach them something so that next time they would not repeat the mistake? Where am I giving the feedback? Is it um, in a safe place for both of us? Is it in my office? Is it where no one can hear? Or is it in a conference room? Or is it where in public where everybody can hear what I'm saying? Who am I giving the feedback to? What is my relationship with this person? And more importantly, what do I want this relationship with this person to be at the end of this conversation? At the end of the day, we are all colleagues, right? What are we saying? Are we saying, how dare you? What year are you? Uh, how come an R3 doesn't know that? Or am I telling them, come, let's look at this case again. Tell me what you think um, uh, about it. How are we giving the feedback is very important. Because if I'm looking to somebody face to face, you know, I'm looking at their expression. Are they mad? Are they smiling? But if I'm sending like, let's say a PAX chat or an email, there is a very big chance of um, misunderstanding. And when? When am I giving the feedback? Is it at 10 a.m. in the morning? Is it at the lunch break or at 2 a.m. when the whole world is collapsing, when they can't keep up, they can't, they can't open their eyes and they can't keep up with the list? Um, the key elements of what we are going to say in for an effective feedback is that it has to be specific, not vague or general, one to two items per feedback. It has to be objective, of course, not judgmental or personal. It has to be constructive based on clear expectation. It has to be fair and honest. And most importantly, it has to be actionable, meaning that I told you you missed this finding in the IOTA, here is a paper uh, or uh, an article or uh, a book about uh, IOTA, read that. Um, and by far, the most important thing when we as educators give a negative feedback to a learner, whether it's a medical student or uh, a resident, is empathy. What is empathy? The ability to understand and share the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another person from their perspective. Put yourself in your learner's shoes. Demoral demoralizing the learner is going to have the opposite effect. This is a paper in the Annals of New Zealand in uh, 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 surgery, and um, they were talking about something very important. They were saying that the residents who are most in need of support, compassion, and guidance and encouragement are actually the struggling residents. And if we have resident who is on probation or uh, performance alert, or they're not doing well, if we put them under more pressure, it's gonna have a totally different outcome. And another important thing that they talked about, and quite frankly, some of us are actually guilty of it, or maybe all, is an observer bias. When I open a report from um, 
a resident on call. And I know that this person is the top of their class. They are doing very well. And I open the report and they're missing something. In the back of my mind, oh, most likely they, they had a bad night. Most likely there was lots of interruptions. This is not at all what's going to be if that same mistake was done by um, a resident who I know they're not doing well. Uh, so we have to avoid observer bias in judging uh, performance of struggling residents. Um, we can't stress enough on the importance of positive feedback. If you see something good, say something good. We, quite frankly, we do uh, very well with um, focusing on negative feedback. When somebody's doing something wrong, we'll go to them and tell them, oh, fix this. But we're not doing a very good job. When someone's doing um, uh, something um, um, uh, good, we tell them that they are doing something good. And as we said before, the cohort of the residents and the medical students we're dealing with are, um, are these overachievers and perfectionists. Positive feedback can boost their confidence and help com combat imposter syndrome. Switching gears now to um, clear, clear, clear goals and educational strategies. These are four suggestions for strategies that we can give uh, our medical students um, uh, clear expectations and goals. First, preset expectations. If we can tell the residents before every rotation, these are the goals and objectives based on your level of training, based on ACGME guidelines that you're supposed to, to, to have. Um, these are the milestones. These are the numbers of study that you are supposed to read based on your level of training. Uh, this is your responsibility. This is your working hour. You know, they, um, let's say they're supposed to work from eight to five, but if they have an, an morning conference, they are expected to be there at 9 a.m. Um, other thing which we can help our resident with is structured learning agenda. We said that um, most of our uh, residents are young millennials and Generation Z. These generations are tech savvy. They are used to getting information quickly through online. And if you go online, there is there is multitude of information out there, which can be confusing and overwhelming. If we can give our resident, let's say, a four week structured curriculum with uh, exactly what they're supposed to read per week, that's uh, of course gonna be uh, very helpful. Um, other thing which um, some papers actually have found uh, uh, helpful and we have uh, did this survey in our program is mid rotation evaluation. Um, giving formal or informal uh, uh, mid rotation uh, feedback to the residents can help them actually know where they are. And if they are not doing well, they will have enough time in the rotation to improve. Um, um, uh, of course, formal competency evaluation is an ACG requirement. All uh, ACGME accredited programs. Uh, must be doing this, they must have a CCC meeting, a CCC committee, clinical competency uh, committee, which is responsible for formal evaluation of the performance of the residents uh, based on ACGME milestones. These are very, very, like if we are planning to give our residents this structured agenda, this is a very good guide for us. The top 10 reading list from Radio Graphics, it's beautiful. It's actually uh, divided based on speciality or rotation and give you basic and intermediate level, what articles, uh, radiographic articles, which is kind of uh, addressing trainings, uh, trainees uh, or residents, um, another thing, of course, is the radiology resident core lecture series. Um, again, these are divided by body, body parts, and there are lots of videos in there that you can actually let this, the resident um, look at these uh, videos. Uh, also, the AUR, uh, so, uh, the APDR, through their uh, the Association of Program Director of Radiologists, uh, through their um, uh, education committee, I think uh, they are about to come out with uh, uh, something similar to that with a structured uh, learning agenda for uh, all residents uh, based on uh, level of training and the rotation they're going into. 
Um, another thing we want to talk about is the Pygmalion effect. Uh, we said that we want um, to give our residents clear expectations before the rotation. What is the number of study I'm supposed to read? We don't want to give them, uh, we don't want to give an R1 on the first CT rotation, 40 studies per day, we're setting them for failure. They might not be able to do that. And also we don't want to tell them read four studies per day, you know, this Pygmalion effect or, or self, uh, 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 self-fulfilling prophecy is that uh, in education, it says that learners do better with more uh, is expected uh, of them. Okay. Uh, then we go to the read world, uh, go to the, uh, our reading rooms, our conference, uh, 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 how can we foster psychological safety in the learning space? First, in the reading room. This was um, a big chunk of what I'm saying now was very beautifully uh, uh, outlined in um, uh, a paper by Dr. Diet and Dr. Petra Lewis and Dr. Gaddy. Uh, it's in the Journal of American College of Radiology that was published in 2023. First thing we want to do as educators is encourage inquiry. The learner's question reflects a knowledge gap that will affect patient care. I want the resident to ask me now when we are together staffing out the case, uh, tell me the question that they have, admit that they have the stuff that they don't know, you know, so that that will affect how the performance when they are by themselves um, on call. So how can we do that? We want to, as we teach um, our residents in the reading room, we want to give follow-up non-intimidating question to make sure that they understand what we are saying and actually encourage them to ask questions. It's okay to say, I don't know. Um, other than that is modeling intellectual uh, humility. Uh, what is intellectual humility is my awareness that there is limit to my own knowledge and that each encounter is a chance to gain knowledge. How can I model intellectual humility? By simply admitting that there is stuff that I don't know. Like if I am as a junior attending, there is a case that I don't really, um, I didn't, I'm not sure what the diagnosis is. It's okay to uh, model uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, humility and uh, go ask a senior attending. Or let's say I'm reading a CT of the abdomen and there's something the spine that I don't I don't know. It's okay to ask a new radiologist. Okay, admitting my own limitation can build trust and motivate trainees to admit uh, knowledge gaps. Uh, lastly, we have to actively explore psychological safety breaches. If there is a resident that appears emotionally distressed or disengaged, we want to actively go and ask them, how are you doing? Um, second conference setting. Um, of course, uh, AB, the diagnostic uh, oral exam are back. Um, so ABR, um, this this uh, res like all ones right now, they're going to take the new uh, ABR uh, oral exam. And that's why we will have to go back to the hot uh, seat sessions. Um, um, so how can we cool the hot seat session? The first suggestion is to use the volunteer method, meaning that I don't have to call call one person out. Um, I can say I want an R2 or an R3 and someone volunteer. If they're struggling, we can um, allow them to call a friend. Uh, if they're struggling, you can ask one of your colleagues. Um, em emphasize on the thought process. It's okay if they didn't reach a diagnosis, just tell them that the thought process were, were right. They described the lesion well. Um, don't give them... 10 million MRI sequences, just tell them, give them a couple of images or a couple of sequences and tell them maybe focus on the liver. Um, another alternative would be, of course, the anonymous audience response system like uh, Poll Everywhere. Um, other challenge that we have as educators when preparing for either didactic or case conference is the generation gap. We have millennials, I mean, 
we don't want to brush everybody uh, like like paint everybody with the same brush but it it is the it is acknowledged that young millennials in particular have short attention span so you kind of have to actively grab their attentions especially in didactic lectures Generation Z are the first generation who are totally immersed in technology. They have no uh, awareness of life before the internet, right? They are digital natives. They have information at their fingertips. Um, so maybe we can always, even if we're giving a didactic lecture, we can make it more interesting by putting questions before and after. And there is something called um, uh, gamification, means it's an active type of learning like simulation or um, uh, um, uh, using games to actually, or group uh, um, uh, case um, um, uh, activities. Um, I think there is an uh, there is an, um, a site like that's called Kahoot that actually can help us with gamification of our cases. Another thing is flipped classroom. The traditional classroom is actually uh, when we um, uh, give a didactic lecture and then the student or the learner goes home and um, studies. Um, the flipped classroom is the other way around. I give them in advance. Uh, like um, online articles or videos to watch. And then the lecture can be dedicated to more um, case discussion or um, asking them uh, for them to ask questions. Uh, and of course, we have to incorporate online and table-based uh, learning resources. Mentorship. Um, Mentorship is a relation between a mentor and a mentee. And its effect is actually, uh, uh, it affects the mentee, the mentor, and the program or the institute as a whole. For the mentee, it contributes to the wellness, career growth, and job satisfaction. For the mentor, it's a personal expression of thanks for the past and hope for the future. It can keep this senior faculty up to date and help avoid their burnout. For the program, when they foster um, an effective mentor-mentee program, they will have um, be rewarded with greater clinical and academic productivity. They will have high rates of faculty retention and promotion. A quality of a good mentee is that they embrace constructive feedback, be cognizant of the mentor's time, follow through on assigned tasks, and maintain optimism. They should also, um, it's expected that they show gratitude, appreciation, professionalism, and ethical behavior. A good mentor, an effective mentor, is the one that shows in enthusiasm, genuine concern, and empathy about the mentee and availability. How can our programs build an effective mentor group? First, um, they have to encourage faculty to be mentors, reward them for their time, offer them protected time, funding, CME credit, put mentorship, incorporate mentorship as a criteria for promotion. Second, they have to do matchmaking. You have to match uh, a mentor with a mentee that they share common interests. Both of them have to commit to confidentiality. Whatever happens, whatever is said between the mentor and mentee should stay confidential. And of course, representation for un, un, uh, like unrepresented minorities. I mean, it's not it's not um, crucial to match a female. A mentee to a female mentor. Actually, as we know, we have only 26% of the radiologists as females, maybe 13% of them are uh, in leadership position. If we're going to limit our female residents to only female um, radiologists, we're kind of limiting their um, uh, chances. So, um, it is good to match um, like the same cohort, if you would say, but it's not essential. And also you can have more than one mentor. Um, mentors as sponsors. Sponsors actually take mentorship to the next level. Uh, they put their mentee in the spotlight. 
um, they can support their application for uh, a national committee. They can write strong letter of recommendation. They can personally use their power uh, in their radiological society to nominate their mentees for talks at a, a regional or national level. Um, mentoring up is actually a concept that um, that actually um, is taken from the economic um, concept of managing up, meaning that the burden of the mentorship does not fall only on the mentor. The mentee has to share the responsibility. Mentoring up is basically a mentee-driven mentoring relationship. The mentee has to take the initiative to tell the mentor what are their goals and objectives from this mentorship relationship. What are the gaps in their knowledge and skills and set objective and attainable, um, attainable objectives and expectations. Lastly, online resources. You, we don't have to limit our residents or ourselves actually to just having mentors within our institutes. There are plethora of online resources. In this paper, actually, there was by our uh, prior residents, uh, Elias Kikano and our uh, current uh, uh, abdominal imaging attending, Dr. Amaya, they actually lay there beautifully all the resources that you can have if you need an online uh, mentor. If you wanna be a mentor or a mentee, you can um, you can go to one of these, like there is the AUR, the, the RCNA, the, um, the SAR, if you want the subspecialties, uh, like like Society of Abdominal Radiology, and so on. Um, as we said, um, big part of building a safe culture is having a good interpersonal relationship. How can we improve the interactions of um, our, um, like all the team, it doesn't have to be just resident and radiologist, resident radiologist, um, maybe um, uh, technicians and nurses and admins, we can uh, plan social activities together. Uh, this uh, can be departmental or small groups. It can be an ice breaker, a low stress eye breaker where technologists and radiologists and residents um, meet uh, together. Um, also, we can do meet and greet for new attendings. And in this meet and greet, um, uh, we can uh, put like um, um, videos for like staff communication, uh, how to um, use nonverbal communications. And another important thing, which is kind of, we, we as the educators, we as radiologists, as attendings, we want to know how well are we doing as far as communication. If we can provide as a program, uh, anonymous, uh, routine anonymous feedback to the radiologist, how well are they doing as far as communication with the residents and put it in a graph. Like if you get, if I get a feedback and I'm getting eight out of 10, is eight out of 10 a good thing? Like, uh, or is most of the, the, the faculty is nine and nine out of 10? Or am I much better than everybody else? So that will actually help me know where I stand as far as uh, psychological safety. Um, we have to assess psychological safety. We have to actively assess psychological safety. And the first thing we have to know when we are assessing psychological safety, when we're asking the residents, is something going wrong, is that it has to be a bi-directional communication. Silence is a communication. You know, if somebody came and told me this is going wrong to me, to somebody else, this is a bad behavior, something uh, abusive, uh, abusive is happening, I must close the loop and go and tell that person, this is what we are trying to do. This is what we did. This is how we try to fix uh, this problem. Um, uh, 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 in the definition of psychological safety is that that person, when they speak up, they are not going to be ignored. How can we um, um, uh, uh, assess psychological safety? Uh, we can, of course, we have to provide our residents or medical students a tool for anonymous feedback that they can send the feedback. If they don't want to be known or identified, they can 
have this tool to actually give an anonymous feedback or a safety uh, report um, uh, without being identified. Uh, other thing is that the fact that I never said that I don't want anybody not to approach me and tell me of something going on, that's not really how, how it is it has to be perceived. I have to actually actively tell them that I want, I want to, I'm listening to you. I want to know if something is going wrong. Um, leadership walkarounds is actually uh, an institutional initiative where leaders uh, actively engage with frontline workers in various clinical settings to uh, identify safety risks. Uh, they have to focus on accomplishment, recognition, and reinforcement to build trust. Um, last, psychological safety surveys. Um, residency programs have to send regular standardized anonymous surveys to assess safety, teamwork, work-life ban balance, uh, burnout, and depression. And there are uh, several uh, standardized surveys that can assess the uh, psychological safety score survey or the mass slash burnout inventory. Um, this was uh, actually an example of a psychological safety uh, survey that was published in the Journal of Patient Safety in 2022. It has this question that through which we can use to assess um, um, psychological safety. Is it difficult to speak up if I have a problem? Is it easy to ask question when there is something that we don't understand? Are disagreement appropriately resolved? Does the culture make it easy to learn from errors? Is it difficult to discuss or speak up about errors? Um, are my suggestions uh, taken seriously? Um, last but not least, radiologists as educators. We are human beings too. We are under stress, you know. Um, I believe um, the biggest transition in our career is not really the first day in medical school. It's not really the first day in residency or fellowship. It is that day you transition from being a fellow to being an attending. This first day that you are actually there, you are signing the report, you are responsible for the list. And then on top of that, I have a first year resident that I have to teach we are not teaching our residents to be educators. We are teaching them to be radiologists, right? They know how to read, but they don't know how to educate. So radiology programs, residency programs have to uh, adopt a culture where it is important to, as part of their required scholarly activities, is that is education. We have to train, practice, give, uh, provide feedback to our residents about being educator. We have to give them protected time to go and educate the junior residents and the, um, uh, and the medical students. Um, other than that, we have to optimize educational interactions. It is, I think, um, uh, it has been mentioned before, I think at AOR meetings, that some residency programs give a different list, assign a different uh, reading list to attendings who are uh, working with uh, residents. Uh, this can be a lower volume uh, 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 working list so that they have more time, they have more time to actually teach the residents, give them protected time to prepare for lectures. Um, uh, um, as much as possible, decrease, inter decrease interruptions, um, uh, phone calls, um, or um, uh, uh, anything that would um, uh, affect efficiency. Um, career advancement, I mean, there is um, most, I mean, every institute is different as far as their promotion, but I mean, I, I believe most of the time it's difficult to be promoted as an educator. In fact, uh, Dr. Petra Lewis have in this noon conference, she has a very, very, very um, um, uh, an excellent actually um, uh, 
um, like lecture uh, talk about how to be promoted as an educator. I've personally watched that twice. It is important to give us clear guide to how to be promoted as educators. You know, um, um, it's not just just about number of publications. I want to be my education activity to be taken into account. This would encourage more faculty to sp spend more time and effort uh, educating uh, residents. Uh, of course, we have to do faculty development, okay? Um, we have to increase the awareness of importance of psychological safety, as we said before, give them individualized uh, feedback. If we feel that they're not doing very well in their interpersonal communication, we can give them, uh, provide them with training uh, uh, if needed be. And um, at the end, uh, I will leave you with uh, this quote from Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they will never forget what you made them feel. Uh, this is actually the paper, if you want to know more about psychological safety, this was a paper we recently published in Academic Radiology. It has much more details than uh, what we just said in this talk. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed, for sharing your lecture today. At this time, we'll open the floor up for some questions. If folks want to ask a question, you can put it into the Q&A feature. Sometimes it takes a couple seconds. Questions to come in? Dr. Mohammed, I'm curious, what kind of things in your own program have you been implementing in service of psychological safety and what's worked so far? Uh, I think um, building uh, this anonymous surveys um, and giving them uh, we actually receive lots of these anonymous uh, surveys that actually initiated by by the residents. We also have these town halls, like it's just the education team and the uh, residents uh, together. Um, we have a formal and informal um mentorship uh, groups like we have we kind of match make um uh, our uh, resident with an attending and the way we do it is that if attend if a resident tells me i'm interested in abdominal imaging they're gonna go with an abdominal imaging um uh, attending but it doesn't have to be just this attending they have can freely actually uh, pick uh, any um any mentor uh, that they want from the faculty. Got it. There's a lot of talk about burnout and across radiologists in any part of their career. And wondering, is there any advice on how medical students or residents can ask for accommodations or, or what this looks like in an environment where psychological safety is paramount and, and foremost? Yeah. So burnout, actually, we have to give our, first of all, they ha we have to give them the space to actually talk about it. You know, um, there is two ways. Either we actually approach the resident who appear that they are disengaged or appear that they are depressed and actively asking them if there is something going on. Or because um, burnout have so many Burnout have so many reasons, you know, it can, it doesn't have to be just the workload, right? It doesn't have to be, sometimes there's something going on in their personal life, like a resident just had a new baby or somebody just got married or uh, they need some time off, you know, something is going on in their life, you know? So the first thing is actually actively listening. Um, um, if somebody appears to be, um, uh, depressed or disengaged, we want to actually reach to them um, um, and ask them and try to um, try to listen to them and know what's what's going on. I think that's it for the questions. So I think we'll wrap there. Dr. Muhammad, thank you again for this lecture um, and everyone else for being here and participating in this new conference. We really appreciate it. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous new conferences by creating a free MRI online account. And be sure to join us again this week, Thursday, October 19th at 12 p.m. Eastern.
featuring Dr. Stephen Rowe for a lecture entitled Current Radiopharmaceutical Theranostic Applications in Nuclear Medicine. You can register for this free lecture at mrionline.com. Follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again, Dr. Muhammad and everyone else. Have a great day.